Welcome to the Sober Stew Podcast. You are watching and listening to an addiction recovery podcast. Today, my guest is a Mr. Michael Seymour. Um, I've known Mick Michael for 19 years, been a pivotal part of my recovery and my journey in sobriety, um, especially in the early days. Um, so where this conversation goes, I don't know. As you guys know, it is unscripted, so we go with what we go with. Michael, welcome. Hello, Stone. Right? I'm good, mate. How are you? I'm brilliant. I'm really good. Wicked. Listen, thank you for coming. I know it's not everyone's cup of tea sitting in front of a camera sometimes, so... Um... I think I was born for it. Do you think it's born for well, it? I've been in the film industry 40 years, and it's the first time I've been this side of the camera. So... <laughs> So it's taken a long while coming, isn't it, really, not. What have you done in the film industry? Just films and TV and commercials and pop okay. I've just done anything, really. Big films. Second That's nature. Me. Well, you're never in front of the camera, you're always behind the camera. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Getting drunk, usually. Right. The first 20 years of it. Causing chaos. Well. Thinking it was all fun. It was. Fun, it Was yeah. it fun? It was fun, but it wasn't for other people. Why, why was it not for other people? When I got sober, I, I was talking to some guy in a meeting, in a, in a chippy or a stage, I can't remember his name yet. But I was talking to him and uh, I was 12 stepping him. And uh, that's for people who you're trying to help him to get him on the, in the program. And uh, I said to him, you know what? I, I said it quite loudly. I said, you know, I was an absolute mug when I was, you probably use another expletive. I was a complete mug when I was drinking. I was just, I thought it was funny, and I was just a mug. And this geezer, this geezer pumps, pumps, piped up. Who I thought was my, I thought it was a friend, and this and the other. And he was the construction manager, so he was my governor, really. And uh, and he went, yeah, you was, you was a complete and utter wanker. And he said it was such venom. I thought that's fine talk. And I, and I, I, I went to go you talk to, and I went, I went really? He went, yeah, you was a complete and utter arsehole and a wanker. And he walked off. I thought, oh, what have I done? I had no idea what I'd done that I was saying. Right. So I pulled it. And, uh, and I thought, so I knew I had a public mate. Right. Thinking I was being funny. And he took umbrage to it. And I, I said a few things. And never thought no more about it. And I thought, I was about that five, six years sober. And I just thought, and eh, many other people yeah. have I affected in my life with my God. When I'm just not even realising. I think it's all a game and it's all funny and you, and you actually, and I still do it today. Uh, I, still, I, still, I still got a big mouth and I still, I still call it bent I and mean, sometimes it's not bent up. But I'm, a, I'm more guarded around that stuff than I than I ever was. But so in your so so, so, so you had little nuggets dropped like that a lot. Yeah, but that's that's recovery, isn't it? It is recovery, yeah. And you know, it's like you don't leave before the miracles, the miracles start and all that stuff and I, when I heard that the first time in a meeting I thought oh god they're waiting for miracles now these people are going well are they what am I doing in here with these absolute bunch of mugs and the geezer come up to me and go what do you think of the meeting I go it's fantastic it's absolutely fantastic so what was coming out of here yeah, yeah. was completely different than what was going in my head because I'd always had an answer in my head I was always trying to work out an answer I was trying to always think of coming back with a, with a with a quip or a wise great and, and anything I didn't understand, I dismissed it as bollocks and right. rubbish. And uh, it was it wasn't it wasn't easy being in my head. And I never realised that. Was that all your life? Basically, yeah. From from like from a kid? Yeah, it's very difficult to analyse something. I'm sixty eight now. Yeah. To analyse something when I'm eight years old. You're looking well by the way. Thank you. I'll just soon have dismissed that and just go, Well that's part of my life. And you know, I can I can go back and talk about this happened to me as a kid, this happened to me as a kid, this happened to me. It probably happened to loads of people. Yeah. But I was born, I believe, with an addictive personality. Not not more so or less so than in another person. It just affected me in the way it affected me, and that was my journey. Uh and I was also at crushing low self esteem. Yeah. And I had no idea it was low self-esteem. I remember getting sober and saying to my sister, I've always been always been shy. And she mm. nearly fell over. She went, you, shy? You ain't got a shy bone in your body. And I was sort of taken aback. I thought, well, that's another thing people thought of me. See, I'm thinking I'm shy. Yeah, yeah. And I've got an impression and mm -hmm. I've got to say this and that and the other, which in recovery terms, we talk about acting out. 
And there's a reason for that. It's because I had crippling low self-esteem. And I will use crippling low self-esteem because it absolutely dogged me yeah, yeah. for all my life. And I had no idea of it. Because I'm making people laugh. I'm getting jobs and losing them. And I'm making friends and losing them. And it was never my fault. It was always, you know, you know it's time to finish and whatever. So keeping a relationship was difficult. Impossible. Cause I, well, because I always thought the grass was greener. Yeah, yeah. And it was always their fault. Yep. And then I might get magnanimous and think, no, that actually was your fault. Then I didn't have nowhere to go with it. So I couldn't sort of like phone you up and go, by the way, yep. I'm having a bit of trouble with this girl. I think it's down to my crushing low self-esteem and my personal <laughs> issues. Because you just do what you, you just do. You just do yeah, exactly. What are you talking about? Go, yeah, see, yeah. An, go see an edge drink. Yep. I'm never going to go and see an edge drink because then they might put me in an ass. Yep. So this is, you know, because... When you've got that sort of denial around yourself, mm-hmm. and I'll go to meetings and I'm reading the books and, and it's saying that people are trapped in self. Yeah. And people are shouting at me at meetings, or well, saying it to me in meetings in cafes, like, well, you're trapped in self. But no one actually got all the hand and went, do you understand what that means? Didn't have a clue. They probably didn't understand it. But you didn't know. I didn't have a clue. I go, yeah, yeah. that voice in the air, they go, what yeah, fun? that's it. Come out of it, yeah, trapped in the head, that's trapped. And this would come out and go, no, not trapped in the head, pal, you're off your head. You don't know what you're yeah, talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. See, I'd dismiss anything like that. And I had no idea I was doing that. I had no idea this voice in the head that's talking to me. I can't, so I can't go to my doctor and go, doctor, my head keeps talking to me. Mm-hmm. Because hey, I ain't never going to put my hands up to that. I'm never going to admit that. Because you think I'm Dolly Dimple. You think I'm, I'm the way with the fairies. So that ain't going to happen. So you had... An inability to be honest about how you felt. Yeah, and I think most humans are like that as a young yeah. age, surely. You know what I mean? Because you ain't going to be able to identify this problem. It wasn't help that I was, I was, I was severely dyslexic. I didn't mm-hmm. find out until I was 48 years old. So I always thought I was thick. Mm-hmm. And teachers kept telling me, you must try harder. Yep. And I kept trying harder. And I kept failing. failing. And, uh, so so I'm, I'm never going to get a claim for me, me dad to say you're bright because I'm, it's not there, the evidence isn't there. So I try to excel in sports and I'm just an average sportsman. Yep. So I represent in my school that every, every sporting, uh, like every level of sports, judo, boxing, football, swimming, anything, yeah. basketball, anything. But I was below average in most of them mm-hmm. and average at some of them. Yeah. And uh, if you're trying to get self-esteem out of that... That ain't going to work, is it? <laughs> it, it but another, another kid will tell you and go... Yeah, but I'm listening to you say that and I'm thinking, that's fucking... That's a big achievement. Exactly. Yeah, another yeah, kid yeah. will go, wow, do you know, I yeah, represent yeah, yeah. him... Of every level, and I've represented my school. That's an achievement. I never looked at it like that. No. I just thought, well, I'm not scoring goals. Fair it must be useless. Yeah, it's another way to beat yourself up. Exactly. Put yourself down. And no idea that I'm beating myself up. So you did that as a child and as an adult? All through my life. I, you know, I, I, I do you did, do it now? I, yeah. Do you? I still, yeah, I still, I didn't realise it. I only found out about five, six, seven years ago. Someone said, well, you classic imposter syndrome. Mm. And I'm always talking about it. Mm-hmm. Never heard of it. Mm-hmm. And that sums me up because I take the job on and I've run some very big jobs. And I don't sort of, I don't sort of get out of it and go, well, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. I'm thinking... <sighs> this is too big, it's all going to go tits up. Yeah, 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 and they're yeah. saying that in the back of my head. But now I voice that, and I go, what? I can only do my best and get on with it. And that, that's a massive change for me in recovery. And I've let go so much when I'm running a job that, that probably to my detriment, because the supervisors I've got running it, they virtually take over, and right. they know more than me, and I'll, and I'll get a bit, just do it my way, no, we do it this way, we don't anything. Yeah, but that's growth though, isn't it? Because if, when you... So I can let go now. Because you can let go. Yeah. Like, learning about that imposter syndrome, I've heard it a couple of times, and I did a podcast the other week with uh, Lauren White, and um, she talks about imposter syndrome a lot. I've been dogged with that from, I can't even tell you from, from what age. Even when I started doing this podcast, right, I'm like... Yeah, but is anyone going to watch it, right? Yeah. Should I be doing it? Why am I doing it? Like, do you, do you see what I'm saying? And, but I've got to be honest, I feel like by doing this podcast, it's helped me overcome this imposter syndrome thing and that low self. I was talking to you earlier about the tooth, I had tooth out and I've got bad, bad teeth through addiction, but not only through addiction, through neglect. 
and neglect because I'm scared of what people think of me when they look in my mouth because my teeth are bad from my addiction and neglect. So what do I do? I don't go. But now I'm like, no, I'm doing it. I don't care what you think no more. You know, it's like, not in an horrible way. I just don't, your faults. It's normal. Yeah, I'm not worried. Do you know what I mean? And like you just said then, if you're letting go of that job, or letting go of the control and letting other people do it. That's the you're, word. You're on that, That's it's a word. bit serene, isn't it? That's the word. Uh, but it's still a part of me, I can't let too much go, because if it does all go tits up. Yeah, it's your name on I'll it. I'll be right. No, and I'll be right, because I knew oh, it. Yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> so it's, uh, yeah, it's amazing, you know, if you got out of bed really, and go, go work. Mm. And not being able to talk to someone, and deflecting it with humour, deflecting it with being drunk, deflecting it of... I've been Jack the Kipper. I'm like, look at yeah, me. Yeah, right. yeah. right. And I, was, I don't think I was ever all right. No. Uh, and then I, 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 had, I had a marriage, I had two kids, I had a, a previous relationship and I had two kids. But So I was functioning. Mm-hmm. But what was you functioning? Well, not, not to the extent that I'm living a, an happy, joyous, free life. But I'm, I'm trapped in fear and I don't know I'm trapped in fear. And if someone someone said to me you're scared, I go, oh, you taunting. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, I'll yeah. be on the back foot all yeah, the time. Yeah, well, your fists are up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've this in the meetings, meetings, and, 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 and I used to say that, and, you know, oh, I'm ten years sober and I'm full of fear. I've been full of fear all my life, and they'd be sitting there like that, you yeah, know. Yeah. And that was the women. You know yeah. I mean? <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, it's just an old boy used to. He comes out of Canny Town, and Canny Town was a bit lively when I was growing up. Uh, very nice, some very strange characters. Anyway. <laughs> He was a bit of a face, this geezer, and uh, he, uh, he had big legs in the rooms. And he used to share that he was dog with fear all mm. his life. And I said, look at him, he's six foot something. You don't know talk about it, but I used to think, stop telling people, you're f- in my head, the voice in the head. Yeah, yeah. The voice in the head would say, stop look, telling people you're full of fear. You're getting Canning Town a bad name, you mug. Yeah, yeah. And when he come up to me afterwards, he go, you're right, I'll go, oh, nice yeah, bit yeah. of speech. You know, yeah. I couldn't voice what was, no. and you wouldn't want a voice what was going in the end. Do you know what, though? And by the way, if you're new around, yeah. and you're thinking, what voice is this man talking about? It's the voice that just went off in your head and said, what voice are you talking about? That's the voice That's in the That's the voice. Yeah. It's always fucking there. Yeah. It's always there. Yeah. I think it's always there. Even... Even now in sobriety, it's there, you know, but it's not pessimistic, if that's the right word, like it used to be. Yeah, it's, it. it's not belittling. Mm. Um, it's not angry mm. or even blaming. You know, like you said to me earlier, when you was on your way here, before, back in the day, you would have gone, why didn't you tell me there was no parking? Do you know what I mean? Bang, the finger's out, isn't it? Mm. But your thought was, oh, I should have got up a little bit earlier and pre-planned that. Mm. It's a completely different, different look on life, different. isn't it? Yeah. Oh man, I don't know. Look, I, I know your journey that you tried to get sober for what, nearly 10 years? Eight years. Eight well, years. listen, as soon as I picked up a drink at 15, I knew this was no good for me because it completely changed my character. But I liked it. Do you like it? I know I liked it. I liked it. I liked the feeling of being in control. Did it give you that feeling yeah, of, of being a, a bigger geezer, yeah. a bigger man? Yeah. Because your, your low self esteem wouldn't let you be yes, that person, yeah. but your head wanted you to be yeah, it. Yeah. So the booze let you do it. Yeah, and I watched too many John Wayne films. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, mine were John Wayne's, but they were different. Like, I wanted, you know, my brother, I wanted to be my brother. Yeah. He thought he was a face around East London, and I'm like, yeah, I want to be him. I want to be him, I want to do what he does, I want to go with who he goes with, and you know, like that little mad, yeah, it's madness, like madness. So you pick up at 15, you know it's no good for you, why do you know it's no good? It made, so I don't like false people, and it made me okay. false. That's what it was, there's a, there's a dynamic there in my character straight away, it's maybe, it's maybe not who I am, and I know I'm not who I am, so there's always that, that feeling of, you're enhancing this behaviour to change the way you feel. And so I sort of understood that at an early age. And when, when, I was always trying to get in the pub, but I looked about I looked about 10 when I was 15. And uh, my voice, I think it had broken, but I don't know. It was a very high-pitched voice. Long, long hair, because that was the, the thing. <laughs> so I looked like a bird, in dear shape. And uh, I was always getting knocked back, no one served me in the pub. And I went with this guy called Kipper. We went to a pub called The Grand in Stratford. Still there, West Ham Lane, and they made the snow bar a disco bar, and it was it was so naff, it was unbelievable. It was a long while ago. And uh, I think he had, like, he had his, his 
light system was three lights going around like that, and that was it. And I think he put his own, own system in. He didn't really have a proper system. He had his own right. stereo system. I think it was that bad. I think he might not have been, but that's my perception of it. And uh, my sheepskin was up. Mm-hmm. Sheepskin is it, your coat, yeah? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the collar was up. Yeah. My collar's always up, but the collar was up. And uh, it was dark. And I've got a light better. I drank the light better. Sheepskin collar went down. I went straight out the bowl. I went, excuse me. You know, to, he served me. And Bill W talked about, in the, in the book of our and she talked about he had arrived. And that was my moment that I'd arrived. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you know, yeah, yeah. I, I felt would, that when you should said it then. Uh, I felt it. I was there with you. Yeah, like, I, I felt that. That felt like a good place to be. I got served. Yeah. And I felt like I fitted in. Mm. And I met people that night who were still my friends to this day. Right. Because we never left that pub. No. Uh, we used to go down and cause chaos. I'd go there and then cause chaos in Stratford. Then yeah. the puddings and that. And we did cause chaos. I'd cause chaos. Yeah. I say we, it me, I cause chaos. Yeah. I was always getting in trouble. Always. I was picking fights. And, I wonder if I could fight. And no, it stayed, so me, it stayed me over. Yeah. It was, yeah. But it just made me game. It made me a better fighter. It made me, I could talk to women. Yeah. I'd still be a virgin if it wasn't for alcohol. I agree. Yeah. It made me yeah, talk to women. And what I'm saying is that persona was not me and I knew it really wasn't me. So when I sober up, I go, I want to get back to that. Yeah. And it's not done like you're thinking about it. It's just done, oh, just change the way I feel. Yeah. And when, when I heard that in the rooms that I drink to change the way I feel, I thought, really? Did no. you not agree with that? No, I didn't agree with anything. Nothing? I don't agree with anything you're going to tell me that's any good for me. Right. Because I've got to have an argument. And don't forget, all my life, I've been coming up with counter-arguments to everything. Yep. So my first, my first nature is to argue. Deny and argue. Yep. And go, oh, I don't agree with that. That's the, if you ask me to do something, my first instinct was to say no. No. And I don't understand that. And I got sober and someone shared it. And I went, God, that's me. Yeah, yeah. I say no. And I notice it now when I ask people, and maybe even our addicts, alcoholic, do you want to do so? And so they go, no. No. And there's a reason for that. And it's because it's low self esteem and it's about commitment and it's about getting out of your comfort zone. And it's not, you know, but having said that, when I was a kid, we used to get things called Green Rovers. And, and I used to get from Canning Town to to uh, Hampton Court. Right. Which is a slap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then we get a green line and we go out to Waverley. I went, I went, I went to a, a, a football match. I went to uh, Wolves when I was about 12. Really? On, the, on my own. On your own? On my own. All the West Ham fans were there. Yeah, so yeah, I was yeah. a part. Well, from East London up to the Midlands. Up to, on my own, boom, done. So I must have had something about me. I had been. a bit yeah, about yeah, yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I never give myself credit for anything. And there was no one there giving you effort. I said to, I said to someone very, I can't tell who that was, but it was a very, do you know what I'm talking about? Very close to me. And uh, I said to him, you're very good, you're not very good at, at, about giving affirmations out, are you? <laughs> and she looked at me, she went, <laughs> affirmations? <laughs> you should have grown out of that at the time he was 12. <laughs> I laughed because it was funny, but she was serious and she said it tongue in cheek, but absolutely bang on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I never grew up. Never. I never. And when I should have been growing up at fifteen, you're drinking. I found alcohol. So you say then that you didn't mature uh, emotionally from fifteen or before that onwards. Before, well, I probably never grew up emotionally. I was very sensitive. I was very sensitive. Yeah. And I didn't like being sensitive. I wanted to be hard. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't go to school when I was fifteen. I bunked off. And I, I thought that was me being tough, a, a rebel. Mm-hmm. But when I went through the work, I realised that was fear. It was fear of my exams. Yeah. I'm going to fail these exams. Yeah, so so I didn't I'm not going to go. Do you remember, you, t- you will remember, we went to the Priory, Alsford Priory for the weekend and you showed me how to go through the steps and you took me through the steps and then um, I sat and did my fear list. Mm. <laughs> and you had I think you was about three years sober at the time and you had taken I don't know how many people through the programme at that point quite a lot yeah and you said to me fuck me I've never seen anyone with a fear list that long I was riddled mm. but you know what that day sharing that with you I felt free getting that out do you know what I mean and it's like I wrote that list I think there was 36 ish fears on it and you told me to pray on it, da 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 da. And then the next day, you told me to write another list in the morning. I had seven on it the following morning. That was, to me, that was like, wow, where are they gone? 
and if you don't do them step tens, you don't realise how you're growing. No. And I didn't, and I, I, I phoned my sponsor up when I was about three months over. I went because I was very cantankerous, I was very aggressive, and I mean I, I'm, I'm, I've seen I've seen a lot of people smaller than me who are explosively aggressive and they're fighting. So I was explosively aggressive to all the wrong people, and I was probably frightening. Right. Uh, I remember having a row with a bus driver. Oh, I was going to kill him because he won't let me on. And what I looked at it when I looked at it, it was because. I thought he'd mug me off and people behind me before I was some sort of mug. So you're worried about what people think of you? Exactly. I never understood that. Because you sobered in? Yeah. yeah, yeah was, so this is why I, you're looking at it later. I, I, yeah, I ended yeah, up yeah, beating yeah. the bus up, cut all my hands, kicked right. it, called him everything. So you're well sobered in? Oh, yeah. I was, I was <laughs> off, I'll still, I'll still lose the plot now. Yeah, I mean, yeah. but not like that. <laughs> and uh, I thought I was going to say that, but I went home and, and worked on that. And, uh, and I phoned a sponsor. I said, see you. I said, this, and he's a very contentious Scotsman, bloody. him. But he's, uh, he's, he's a character. And I phoned him up, and we see you. I said, This ain't working. And his droll Scottish accent, he went, What is he? He said, What part ain't working? I went, What? I said, We ain't done enough work on my step four. And he went, We? He said, Who wrote it? <laughs> Vane popped out the neck. And I went, Well, well that, he said, If you've got something you want to put on your step four, come back here and we'll go over it again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is the lifetime's work. And did you have stuff that you hadn't put down? Oh, it, it, well, let me finish. I went in. In the 12 by 12, I said, we haven't done enough work on six and seven. I said, so, uh, I said, we are in the 12 by 12. He said, why are you reading the 12 by 12? He said, that's the people who know what they're talking about. He said, you know nothing. I said, oh, three months, I'm, I'm nearly a year sober. He said, no, you're not. You're three months sober since you started doing this work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you didn't have a clue before you started doing this work. I went, <laughs> You can't argue. I want to argue on. And he went, by the way, how much do you want to talk about six and seven? They're two paragraphs in a book of 168 pages. How much do you want to talk about that? <coughs> Let's keep it simple, eh? Mm. He went, oh, you was that? I said, uh, when I said, I said uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still angry. <coughs> and he went, anger comes from fear. Yeah. How's your fears list? He said, get your book out. Let's have a look at it. So I had about three months of Germany. What you kept it for solid for three months? I kept it for eight years. Wow, every night, every eight, night, every night. Right? Oh years. man, then I then I stopped slowly. Window, then I looked back at it and I just felt so sad for that person. Yeah, I was absolutely mad when I was no, that's a wrong definition to keep saying. I was mad. You weren't well, there was no one in the world would have put me in a nut house. Yeah. I wasn't right. Yeah, I was an emotional, emotional wreck trying to deal with the emotions of a lifetime mm -hmm. in a year. Yeah. And it ain't gonna no. work. And if you're prone to anger, you might be prone to isolating, then you will isolate. You may be prone to gamble, then you will gamble. You may be prone to thief, you will thief. And I've watched this, this, this in other people in early sobriety, they just ping off in different directions. They don't drink the drug. Who am I to judge them? Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, he said to me, uh, get your book out. Yeah. So I got this book out and I looked at it and I went, and I went through it and I said, resentment, that, that, resentment, this, that, 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 and then day about resentment out of fear. And I looked and I went, how's it happened, John? I said, I can see in my own handwriting when my, uh, my anger and my fears have dissipated. Right. And he went, that's... And six and seven. That's six and seven. And it's God doing for you what you can't do for yourself. He said, and listen, he said, it's not that treatment centre you went to. He said, it's not, I'm getting emotional now. Yeah, yeah. It's not them counsellors you dealt with. He said, it's not 90 meetings in 90 days. He said, it's not me, and it's definitely not you. <laughs> And he said, God is doing for you what you can't do for yourself. Yeah. And with that, I got a lump in my throat mm. and I started crying. Tears started coming out. And I was shaking. And I just sort of understood. One to twelve. It was like, brrr, bang. I, I had it. I don't know why. I just went, wow. I like, yeah, I said, then I started talking quietly. I went, as it happens, John, I said, yeah, I can see that. Yeah. I, I can see that. And I haven't had a problem with an eye power ever since.
Never. And I had a problem with God. I, I mean, I was brought up a Catholic, and I just rebelled against that. Do you, so do you think that was one of the first times, you know when someone That was my spiritual awakening, but Yeah, and you know when someone's told you something, and your head used to be like, yeah, I agree with that, but the voice in your head would be like, fuck off. Exactly. That was the first time you that didn't happen? No. Nah. Because you were told him you agree with it, and you actually fucking felt it. That, I felt it, that's yeah, the thing, yeah, yeah. I just went... I wow. could see it. I could wow. see it in my own handwriting, and I mm. went, "Wow, give me goosebumps." You're giving me a few now. Yeah, I just, I just went, "Wow," and I was sharing that with a guy at a meeting, and we was watching a film about Bill Wilson, and I shared it with this guy, who was a Roman Catholic priest, but I didn't know he was a priest because he had his civvies on. Right. And he went, "I'm with my, my his father, so and so." He went, "It's a beautiful story." He said, "And that's uh, that, that, that was your spiritual way." Yeah, yeah. And I swore, and I went, every man said, I'm in a spiritual right then, I didn't even know that one. <laughs> that's how, you know, yeah. we laugh about it, but really that's how naive I was. Yeah, yeah. And how thick, thick, just... It's naive. Closed right? off, closed off from anything spiritual, because I thought, anything spiritual, anything to do with God is weak, because you're going to look a mug. Yeah, yeah. You're going to look a mug, and the people I drink with, I'm a scapholder. Yeah, yeah. You know, you're going to carefully load of scapholders, you ain't listening. So fair play to people that do it, these reborning in Christians. Yep. Because they don't they get short strift of most people, but fair play to them. Hello guys. Hope you're enjoying this week's episode. Just a quick break here. I want to ask you a big favour. If you are enjoying the show, enjoying the episode, enjoying the podcast, can you please subscribe? Please like, please share. I just want to let you know how important that is. It, the bigger this channel gets, the more people that see it means that we can affect people's sobriety in a positive way, their addiction recovery. We might change a life, we might save a life. Enjoy the rest of the episode. Thank you. But uh, you said something about the other day, people have been brought up with a God, yeah. and people who find God in later life. Are two, two different people. Two different people, yeah. I feel that, and that's just a perception. I feel like, you know, I was talking to a friend of ours who, who we know, and you know, he's a born again Christian, he found, he found God in, um, in recovery and talking to him, he's got a different viewpoint on godliness or, you know, that, them feelings, that spirituality, then I'd say somebody who's been brought up with it. Sometimes people who've been brought up with, uh, with God have got like a fear factor attached to it as well. Mm. And I don't think, if you've come through, you know, addiction recovery and fan your higher power, fan God, I don't see any fear elements to, to that higher power or God. I've never had any of you. But then you was what the punishing God. Yeah, I've yeah. never had that. Yeah, I've yeah. never had that. And I, and I and I think that's still in me. I think because you had God as a kid. Yeah, Z used to say that. She said, "I'm a Catholic. I'm a." Uh, she said, "I'm a Catholic Irish alcoholic. Yeah. I'm in the CIA." Yeah. <laughs> and she said, "The once you're in, you can never leave." Yeah, and I yeah, thought, yeah. I laughed. I thought, "Gosh, you're right." Yeah. The guilt comes up. I've got, an eye for, I've got an eye level of guilt. And, it, and, and people listen to this and go, you guilty, yeah, you, you things you've done. And it's all done in acting out and it's cool. all done to show off and it's what I do, look at me, I'm here. And I resented that when people pointed out to me. In treatment centre, in treatment centre, they kept pointing out I'm acting out and I'm fucking acting. You've acted out all your life though, from yeah, what you've said today, haven't yeah, you? Yeah, And you don't know you're doing it. doing it. And it's second nature to me, really. And it's the dialogue and it's the quick whips. and I still do it. Mm. But that's worrying about what people think all the time. Exactly, isn't it? yeah. Always. The yeah. underlining reason for all that acting out has got to be. But then the other half of you goes, well, if they don't like it, they can have it any way they want it. And yeah. then that yeah, yeah, comes and the out. ego yeah. and the bravado. Yeah. So there's a conflict there, isn't there? Yeah. Low self esteem and high, and high ego. So that, that's step four, six, seven, and ten, really. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and, and my understanding of powerlessness. It's getting bigger as I get more sober, and it's, it's you know, I used to hear people say, people like, parents, other people, places, and things. Well, identify, what does that mean? Yeah. What does that mean? Basically, yeah, exactly. And, and all I can say to you is the more I know, the less I know. The more I understand, the less I understand. Because, and that's too difficult to explain. Yes, it's I like lots of things in, in, in recovery. It's, you know, oh, it's key to separate. Oh, it's an old thing, but he said, uh, he said, you got to teach his goal. I said, how do I stop drinking? How do I stop drinking? He went, oh, my God, he said, you, can, you must like getting drunk. I said, I don't like getting drunk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, well, you're doing something, wrong, you? He said, well, you've got to do this. You got to... It is go. He means surrender. Oh, uh, why? Why did he say that? I don't know. Why did he say let it go? And that's what he meant. Yeah. I never pushed him. I just want to stab him. Yeah. Because I'm thinking, well, I don't know. Yeah. 
Because you're struggling. Yeah. You're in pain. So, uh, uh, people identify that. People who go, oh, you're trapped yourself, explain that. Yeah, if you yeah. can. So what, you see, so what you're saying is, in, in, when you try to get sober for them eight years, in and out of rooms, and talking to people who were sober, are you saying they didn't tell you enough of what was wrong? No. I, I, well, I, to I, a level. I pulled him when I got sober. Right. And I went in and see you. Yeah, yeah. He helped me a lot, this kid. He's, he's top man. He's a really diamond. He's a, he is a spiritual job. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I love this. Thanks, Keith. And he said, <laughs> I went out to him and I was fucking feeling it. I went, see you. He said, you didn't tell me I could go through this work quickly. You couldn't tell me this. He looked at me and his eyes went, his big Irish went, he went, Michael, I've been trying to tell you this program ever since you walked through them doors. Wow. He said, you had fuck off running across yeah, your yeah, forehead. Yeah, yeah, And I went, oh, a bit harsh. You didn't want to listen? No, I didn't. You weren't ready? I, Which, I, I, what I heard, there was always an argument going on in the head to defeat what they yeah, said. Oh, right, let me ask you a question then. Was you going to the meetings originally for you or for your family? Oh, I can't really the answer that. I like to tell you it's for my family. But once I got there, I realised that it was... I understood that concept, that you, only you could get yourself sober. Yeah, yeah. By, so I understood that. But I thought, there's got to be an easier way. I'll, I'll share it. I, I, I really believed if I kept coming back in the States, I was coming back, because it never got any better. They made years. It just went, it deteriorated. And uh, I thought one day they're going to get hold of me, take me to the law room, put a little apron on me, with all these signs on it, and roll my trousers leg up, and I was become like Freemasons of Alcoholics Anonymous, and they was going to tell me, they was going to tell me the coup, because I just kept trying to find what the coup was. And all my life, I thought there's got to be an coup. angle, there's got to be somewhere, yeah. and yeah, you know, there is a rule, and the rule is saying oh, it's 250 or whatever it's called, and uh, the rule is there are no rules in AA, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so yeah. that's the coup. Yeah, there are no rules, and it's just about. I oh, work and uh, who wants to be that? I want to go in a meeting. Do you just want someone to flip a switch for you That's and it. fix you? Oh, like like most modern people do now. Of course they do. Pop a pill or, pop a pill, or, or yeah. do you know what I mean or whatever it might be. Don't want to do the hard work. I go and see me therapist. Yeah, fucking hell, the hard work's hard. Yeah, talking's hard. Yeah. Being honest, you listen. You just sat there and told me you weren't really honest with anyone about how you feel ever. So when I'm telling you you've got to sit here and be a, it's a program of honesty, I ain't gonna fucking want to do that. Yeah, I'm gonna go. Yeah, you're yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's see right. See ya. Yeah. I was in treatment and they said, uh, I was fuming in there, I was angry. And uh, they said, this geezer went, what do we think about Michael? And this big lump said, he, he said, uh, well, he's very defensive. And I thought, defend, I'm sitting like that. I'm sitting like that. And I'm like, defensive? I said, which one way to defend? I'm bitch right away. And they started laughing. Oh, fucking hell. Like, yeah, oh. yeah. And the counsellor went, well, your arms are folded. That's a defensive position. I went, really? Really? And I went like that. Put my hands in my crutch like that. Yeah, yeah. Which is even more defensive. And they all started laughing. They went, that's called defensive. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll give it to the guys outside. So you ever make me look a mug like that in front of people again, I'll know where you live. Mm -hmm. You're at that door. There's no locks on the doors. I'll be coming in at two o'clock in the morning. I just terrorised the guys. Yeah, yeah. Just because he challenged me. But if you've got that sort of mentality... You think that everybody's having a diggy or a pop at you, and you can't talk to me like, who the hell did I think I was? You um, were, yeah, you were fucked. Yeah. Really? I've built such Belligerent. A, more like, yeah. I've, I've built such a barrier around yeah, me, yeah. That nothing was ever going to come down. But there were still beautiful people who still tried to help you. Oh, mate, Jean took me to my treatment centre. Jean took the, the day off and took me to, and I got there, it wasn't let me in. It wasn't let me in, it was too early, they didn't mean that. I, I, she come on, come on. She, tell me, she took me there, sat, bought me something away, yeah, yeah, yeah. she took me back there. She phoned my sister up and said, oh, I don't expect him to be in there too long. I'll give him a couple of days. She said, he's, he's absolutely fuming. I'm fuming going in there. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my. Scared. Scared, yeah. Scared anger comes boy. from yeah. fear, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah, anger comes from fear. And there's that little boy who never grew up. Yeah, but you, you, you're never going to admit that because you've got a never. mortgage. You've got a wife, you've got kids. And, and you're from East London. And I'm not being funny for, you know, this this will be seen all around the world, right? And there'll be people from East London who see it, but there'll be people in America and in Canada and in Australia, whoever it might be as well, that that I talk to who view this podcast, they won't understand potentially what East London's about. East London's about, like the geezer you just mentioned, big hard man, right? This is how it's got to act. You've got to act. Uh, I'm not frightened of nothing. 
can't discuss and tell anyone how you feel, you've got to be the man. Mm. So you can't tell people how you feel, can you? No, and looking Even up, going into the treatment centre, you're lying. Yeah, and, and looking up to people who are aren't, wrong. Ain't the best role models. No. I used to bunk off school and I used to go around and play the one armed band with all the pinball machines in, in, in a family of scrap metal merchants in, in Canning Town. And they're all, they're all villains. I mean, one, one of them nearly got blown up, and he, he, he's a Republican Christian. Right. But they, yeah, people who know I'm talking about it come again. So there was strange families there. Like villains. And, they, and I, in the working men's club where I grew up in, there was like this good and evil. The, the bank robbers and all the nutters would come in, and they'd be the committee men. And the committee men was proper, they used to have been through the war. Yeah, yeah. And they used to chuck these people out. And I said, yeah. can you chuck a bank robber out? Yeah. You're only a committee man. Yeah. You know, so I always veered to the... The bank robber. Yeah. Yeah. And there was Same. a in there. There was a load of them in yeah. On a Sunday. I wonder what it is, man. I wonder what it is. Do you think it's because... I don't know what it is. That was my mentality. You know, I wanted to... I didn't want to work. I wanted to get easy. It's the same thing. Fix me quick. Yeah. And it's it fix me quick. I want a quick bit of dough. I don't really want to go out. I want to be in the pub. Um, I want to be with all the geezers. Um, you know, that's my life. That was my aspirations in life. Didn't I, have any more than that. I had a moral compass to stop me selling drugs. And I suppose anybody that wanted me to go on the black room, but that sort of that when I moved out of Canning Town, I, I sort of got away from them people. And not that I was with them anyway, but as I got older, I'd have gone into boozers and this, that, and the other. So I was, I was fortunate there, and I see a lot of people do loads and loads of bird. Because they had that, they want to be different, and they want to be special and different, and they want to be this, and they want to be that, and that's fine. Yeah. But there's consequences. There's consequences. And, and it's a lot of, lot of prison. It's so I, I, was, I was fortunate that, that, I'm not saying that would have happened, but it could have happened. But I could have, I could have served up drugs. I veered away from it. So for the simple reason is I couldn't justify it. Especially you've got about five to ten years for, for serving up drugs. And your kids have got to visit you there and they're going to school again with dad's blood dealer. Yeah, yeah. What sort of role model was that? So, I, you know, being an alcoholic, fine. Because I wasn't an alcoholic. <laughs> I wasn't an alcoholic. I, you know, I, I went to a meeting in the West End of London because I thought if I go to a meeting in the East End of London, people are going to know me. You know, that's how special and different I was. I thought I'd be a face in a meeting of alcoholics. And was you? No, I met no. two. I met like two people I drank with. That's it. That's about it. But that meeting I went to, I went in suited and booted at Iron Street. Right. And uh, I'm looking around, and there were some beautiful women. Yeah. All suited and booted. All the men, not, not all of them, but it was, that was a big meeting in days. It was about 60, 200 people there, I would say. Right. Suits, all going to suits, because I'm in the West End. Yep. And, and there were. Uh, a street drink, and he's and, and a Scottish guy come up to me and went, "Be all right." I went, "Me, it's my first meeting." They went, "Yeah, we know that, don't you?" So the geezer, it was it's eighteen months old. We was ex street drunk, and this other geezer is about 10, 12 years sober. Even now, it works Scotsman from Glasgow, and I really got the hump because <laughs> I thought all well, these people going, but I've got a lovely jacket on and a nice shirt. I look, the, I really look the part, and I'm talking to these two blokes. And uh, he gave me a tiny bit of information, really. So you just keep coming back. Is that what said? Yeah, and do the work. And do the work. Yeah, but that's the important bit. Yeah. So what bit did you hear that day, keep coming back? I heard the blonde woman at the end. Yeah, yeah. Because I looked at the steps and I thought, oh, I hate a bit of Catholicism, that. And I listened to the guy, the secretary, and I thought, no, I'll be here a month and I'll be secretary because I'm, I'm the branch secretary of my union in work. So I'll be the bar, I could do that. And I thought, well, you know what, Kilroy was a... And you remember Kilroy? I think you remember it. I do remember Kilroy. They used to wear masks, yeah. didn't they? Yeah, the old yeah, used to wear yeah. masks. I thought, I could probably get on Kilroy in a few months. And I thought, yeah, I wonder if you get a CB out of this. And I'm, all that nonsense was yeah, But can your head do that now in Sprite? What? Because my head can go like that in Sprite. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but this woman at the end of it, gorgeous looking blonde woman, and uh, she spoke in a best BBC plummy voice. And she said, and today, I haven't woken up, and I haven't pissed the bed. Mm. Well, my jaw went like that, and I thought, how could you share that in front of all these people? Mm -hmm. I thought, shame on you. I thought, and I was going to take you out for a coffee. <laughs> so, uh, no, nah. so anyway. The, uh, honesty, though, eh? Oh, mate, blew me away. Yeah, look at honesty, somebody's recovered. Yeah, yeah. And, and just share that. She don't care. She's helping another human being. Another. Yeah. 
Powerful, isn't it? Yeah, because I pissed the bed, but I blamed, the, do- I blamed the dog. Yeah. I blamed the wife, I blamed yeah. the dog. It was never my fault. Pissed, oh, what happened there? I could not floor, do that. Pissed on the car. No, I didn't do that often. Oh, I did. I'm in mean, the yeah, wardrobe, yeah. yeah. <laughs> States are just again. Oh, man. So go, let's go back a minute, actually, because you said to me, uh, well, you weren't three months, but your sponsor told you you was three months sober. I was, about, you, I was nearly a year. You was nearly a year, yeah. right? So Absolutely. then... Your life must have changed. When you had that spiritual awakening and realisation that, and this is down to the fact that, or two, two points here actually, one is that you've done the work, but secondly, more importantly, I think, or as important, you journaled it, right? So if you hadn't have had well, it- Well, you told me to. Yeah, but if you hadn't have had it written down in your no. own handwriting, like you said, you wouldn't have believed it. No, no I forgot. Right, so- I forget anything like that. Okay, so if you're not journaling your work in recovery, especially early recovery, you ain't seeing the growth here. Wish I would have kept the books now because it would have been an insight, really. But uh, it was the, I just went, I went, this is, why am I looking back at this? And did I you get rid of them? Yeah, I'd throw them all away. You did? I'd throw them all away. And it was all about me, really. It was all about me and it was about my ex wife. It was about the resentment around her boyfriend. It was just, I don't know, I just think, really? Yeah, you didn't feel like that then. You'd I gone. mean, I, I wasn't gonna kill him mm. in my head. I thought I wouldn't have killed him, but I mean, that was, that was living in my head every day. I was going to kill him and she do her and I've been done wrong. And then the other time I had a go, no, you ain't even alcoholic. And I'm right down on these steps. And then fear come in again. Yeah, yeah. And I thought, hey, here comes some fear. This is gospel, right? <laughs> I mean, fear comes. I must be fighting with him. And I've threw this pen down and I've jumped up in this hotel room when I was in. It was a bed and breakfast in, in North London where the council put me. Right. And I'm shadow boxing. In the mirror, like, yeah, like yeah. Robert De Niro, yeah, yeah, yeah. you looking at me, yeah. and I went, I'm scared of him, I'm fucking, 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 i am Exactly. Ooh. And as I wrote that, I went, that's my pride. That's your pride. Yeah. That's what people have been talking about in these rooms for the last eight years. That's my pride and that's my ego. And I clocked it. That day, writing that down, so many months sober, because I could verbalise anything. Yeah, it's my ego, yeah, it's my pride. You've got to feel it. Oh, I'm big time. I went, wow. I went, well, why didn't I come in and have a train I thought, oh, fuck hell. I'm 10 years older than our missus. Mm-hmm. Right. She left me for a geezer who was 10 years older than me with a speech impediment. They talk about ego deflation, trust me, that's ego deflation. And I thought, if I go around and have a straight to women, it's mostly beats me. I'm never going to live it down. And there again, fear, fear what people think of me. Yeah, everywhere. I, I wrote that down. And I understood it. And I wrote, suppose I did kill him, I can be in prison. Then I went, he met his kids. And then he said, about that, about this, about that, about that. In fact, you sitting in the prison cell, but I'm like, I'll just, I swear, that man, from that moment on, was never in my head again. Never. Ever. I've got resentments of other things that happened. Yep. No, I mean, and Not it just it. went, and I went. And I just, the, the power of that. Yep. I'll never stop sharing about it, means. No. The power of doing step tens. Because, when I come around, a lot of people wasn't doing step teams. A lot of people hadn't done the steps. Like a lot of people in the rooms, it was just keep coming back. And uh, a lot of people saying, Anthony Prisons, bless him, whatever they was doing. And I owed him a debt of gratitude because they kept the meetings open. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and yeah, there, was people, there was people taking you through the work, but I... They weren't, they weren't, they weren't up to my speed, really. Yeah. <laughs> no, I had four sponsors and they was all good. They was all good people. They all give yeah. you something. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the last part one, of your journey. The last it? one was the, was the last person I was expected to, because he was he, the people didn't like people still don't like him. Oh, John. John's people still don't like. Yeah, him. listen, he ain't. I don't. Look, I ain't seen that geezer for years, but I don't think he's he's everyone's cup of tea. No, and I, it's exactly the same. But you know the way, I'll tell you one of the reasons why he's not only everyone's cup of tea, from my perception, is that he tells you what he thinks, hmm. right? Something that we don't do in in our in our lives normally, and he ain't got an issue with doing it. He, 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 you know, I used to sit there when I met him at the beginning years ago, and I'd think, 
fucking hell, he just like, don't care what, he don't care, he just tells you. He tells you exactly what the programme is. Yeah. And, and he turns people against him. He does. And, uh, but that is what it is. That's what he does. Because you didn't walk away from him. And even that weekend I went away with you, and when I'd done that step work, he was there that weekend, I got a lot from that man. Yeah. I got a oh, lot from listen, that man. Oh, no, I wouldn't be sober, was it? No. I mean, step 10 saved me life, doing that inventory of a night. That's why, I, I, and the amount of people who don't do step 10s who, who say they don't yeah. work steps. 10, 11, and 12 are in the past tense. Yeah. So they're meant to be done in the year and now. The first nine are meant to be done in the, in the past tense. Yeah, yeah. Done, dusted. So 10, 11, and 12 on a daily basis is your main And they, they, steps, they encapsulate the yeah. first nine steps. Everything's there in them three cool. steps. Give me, a, give me an idea of what. Back in the day, when you're sitting there and you're doing your 10, 11, and 12, your maintenance steps, how would how would that look for you on a daily basis? In case there's a newcomer here, someone's just gone through the program, someone's took them through it, and they're, they're, and they're told to live in 10, 11, 12. What, okay, well, my, my step four is the same as my step 10. Okay. It's a deck. So I was in cause effects. My mistake, uh, who gets armed? So yeah. Who gets armed? My mistake, powerful. Okay. Before the new. Selfish, self seeking, dishonest, frightened. And inconsiderate if it's a partner. And you get a pen out and you look at that and you write that every day. But then, what other people don't, I spoke to, who are in a lot of trouble with fears and anxiety, they go on frightened. They go, please remove my fears. Right. Well, that's fine doing that, but if you keep getting anxious about something and it's not being removed, then. Go look at it. So you alienate what that fear is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you write that fear down, do it in the columns if you want to. Instead of putting the resentment, put that fear. What's the cause? Mm -hmm. What it affects personal relationships, sexual relationship, pride, ego, financial insecurity. Well, it's called insecurity. It? So you're looking at every aspect here, stuff that you don't even want to look at. When you mention sexual relationships and financial and, and pride and all that, these are the things that you want to keep personal, but you're looking at them, mm. scrutinise them mm. daily. And you're sharing it with someone. And you're sharing it. Uh, then, and, I don't speak to John so much now. Well, I don't very rarely speak to him, but I speak to other people. Yeah, he's giving, he's, he said to me, he said, I want to give you this message. We might not become the best friends, but he said, I've done my job. Mm -hmm. And we were friends, and he's a good man, and yeah. he's fantastic. But I don't feel the need to phone him. No, no. Like that. Well, you're an independent man who's That's got it. a program in your, in yeah, your and life. I, and you? I can speak to you, yeah, I can speak course. to other people I sponsor, and I can speak to anybody. Yep. And I'll tell you what, if you've been doing this stuff for many years and you can't work out what's wrong, then there's something, right, something seriously wrong with you. Maybe you need to go and see a therapist. Maybe you need that extra bit of help. Mm -hmm. Because it's, it ain't rocket science. So, Gordon, you're doing your step 10. What should step 11 and 12 look like? 10, they call it 10, but it's really an 11. It's it exactly is 11, the same. And, and, and 12 is what I'm doing now. It's carrying this message. Carrying this message. Yeah. That's the only reason I'm doing it. Yeah. It's because hopefully someone will get some benefit. Yeah, I agree. You know? But the little imposter, he just went off and that's never going to happen. That's never going to Just happen. Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're intrusive faults. That's what they really are. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing you can do to stop them. No. And uh, you just got to just... He used to say to me, he, he's a Christian, he used to say to me, uh, it's the devil. It's just tell the devil to live off. And I thought, well, that's a really easy concept. You know what I mean? You've got good and evil. Yeah. And there's good, then there's an evil. So just tell the evil faults and just... Do you know what? I've looked That's at what I don't Yeah, I don't care. I might, I might hang on to it for a day or two, but in the end I go, well, you shut up and piss off, you know, how ridiculous you sound. Yeah. And I might have to write it down, and I might have to ask for a bit of guidance, and I might speak to someone about it. But they're very few and far between. Yeah. And if you're speaking to your sponsor every day, which people do every day for a year, yeah. then I, I don't know, we, we, you must be one seriously ill bunny because. Oh, no, that's not being flippant. I mean, you, you put it codependent. Maybe. Maybe. I don't, I don't know about that. I mean, but after a few months of getting it, I'm getting spiritual awakenings. Yeah. Not the thing yeah, with yeah. that get on my own back. With me and, and that's Because you're doing about. the work and you're writing it down. Mm. So if you're not writing it down and you're speaking to your sponsor every day, you're not seeing your growth. No. With your own writing. Mm. That's the power of the pen. Yeah? The, the, this is what you told me, you know, and I've got to be honest with you, I didn't write every day, right? I got to that point where I was like, I can run this for your head. I can run this in my head, mm. right? I'm clever enough to do this. I can run it in my head. And I'd, I'd sit there on the sofa at night or I'd lay in bed and I'd go, right, I've had a resentment day. And I'd look at it. Oh, but the thing is, it got to the point where I pick up a resentment now. I thought you'd said something right here, right now. I'll go, hold on a minute. Bang, 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 bang. And I run the column through where and I go, I'm fucking scared. 
I'm, I'm worried about what you think of me. And then I'm letting the resentment go. So I'm justifying the fact that I don't need to use a pen. But, and this is a big but, so after a couple of years in recovery, I then went downhill in recovery, mentally unwell, because I wasn't, I wasn't writing. I wasn't journaling. I wasn't doing the work that had been freely been shown to me. So I suffered, I suffered. And in turn, other people around me suffered as well. That's my truth. That's mm. the reality. Um, you did that for eight years. So every, that, night. every night. But that was, all, that was probably fear driven as well because uh, I was saying it was discipline, but I did not want to relapse. And when I was in their treatment centres, all they kept saying is, you're in relapse, you're in relapse. You know, I don't think it's healthy, but you know, that's what they've done. And, uh, I can't argue with it because I say so. But I said, I've yeah. got a lot of, I ain't got a lot of problems with anything, doing anything. You can do whatever you want to do and it's none of my business. But uh, I won't wish, I will not wish my first years recovering on anybody. I won't wish my first, my last years drinking on anybody. In the treatment centres, because I was so self-will one right, it was painful. It was really painful. People, I mean, mate, they had got an assessment and they had to tell you what they thought about you. And I can't bring it on, yeah, see how yeah, I bring it on. Yeah. I wouldn't iron the skin off a couple of them. Yeah, I, yeah. I thought, you wouldn't say that in my face, you're saying it because you're surrounded by all these people. And I was sitting here, yep. smiling. And I got in my room, my room was next to the next to the place where they think meetings. And I was sat on the bed, and I went, God, is that what it really think of me? I put my head down, I went, boom, I'm going to sleep. And what? I slept through the next meeting, and I woke up about three hours later. It, it Emotionally drained. Knocked me to six. And yet I sat down thinking, this is all like this, yeah, where's it? You fucking hate your sayings without me, I'm bulletproof. Do you know when you was in treatment, right? I was talking to a lady last week, I did a podcast last week, Janice Johnson Dalbo, and she said that when she was in treatment in America, um, her children wrote, yeah, wrote her the letters yeah, the, yeah. about how her alcoholism affected them. Did you have anything like that? They come up and told me. What, face to face? They didn't bring Billy up, you know, the young, he's, he's going through his exams, but my daughter came in with pedigree. She told you proper? Oh, proper. How did that make you feel? She, she came in and it was a, she was dressed in high power. She had the suit on the tie and it was like oh, a business she, meeting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. My wife defended me. Did she? Yeah. So she didn't want you to feel no pain? No, she just, she's like that. She, you know, she loved her shit and something. She's very, yeah, she's like very grounded like that. She said, oh, I've done as bad as him and I, you know. But your daughter give you... Did he, was he ever violent yeah? And he, she went, he hit me once. And my daughter and the cancer went, once? And I just went in the heart. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you. And uh, mm. it was his fucking terrible stomach. Yeah, mate. Yeah. yeah. I remember reading me. <laughs> Do you know what it is, though? It's like... But, I mean, I think that relationship, it's that relationship was... Ruined by alcohol. Yeah, and, and this is what alcohol does to people, right? I come home drunk as usual, and uh, it wasn't usual because I knock. I was functioning. I'd knock on the head for the weeks, and I'd, I'd bang on it on weekends, and it's always in. It was getting mad. But I come home this day, and I went, and the niece was there. And I went, oh, I said, I'll stop drinking. I'm going to And I was drinking whiskey, and I, went, I don't drink whiskey. Well, your wife and her, her niece. Her niece, right? I went, oh, just, she ain't getting none. She ain't getting. I went, I want to get a 3%. This is how deranged that was. So I thought, I heard someone say about feigning a suicide. Faking a suicide? Yeah, but I, I was going to do the proper one. I went in and opened up on medicine candy, trying to say, and I see the paracetamol, and I remember reading somewhere that they kill you, so you don't want them, do you? So I put them right in the back. Right. I took out the dog mine tablets, probably her birth pills, anything that ain't going to kill you, and I crushed it all up, and I put it on the front, and I put it down right there, and I went, Come back in, I went, I've taken an overdose, phone me an ambulance. She looked at me and went, phone your own fucking ambulance. Wow. That's so you got to that point. That's what alcohol does to you. I'm sick of you fucking telling me what you're going to do and what you ain't going to do. Just do whatever you, just get, get away from me. That girl, two years before that, would have smashed me over there with the frying pan. Yeah, yeah. She'd have jumped all over me. She'd have gone, don't you put some fucking... That's what alcohol does, yeah. Just say, uh, do a good guy. So I did phone me on the end. Did you phone him? Yeah, and I, yeah. Went, I went up and I tried to get a treatment center. And then the council was saying, the uh, hospital was saying, we don't, do, we don't do treatment centers. He said, this is an A&E. I've got these things on me. I was like, don't remember me. Don't come and give me a look. That you can't really, that I don't remember anymore, really. But I talked myself into a, a 
She drove me down. It was well, I don't remember that. She drove me down to a nut house, mm-hmm. East Ham Memorial. I woke up a couple of days later and I've gone. I was over and around, a big black guy went past someone, excuse me mate, I said, what treatment centre when did you get back in your bed? I went, oh, you, oh, that, wait, but what, oh, you should get back in your bed. I went, what treatment centre when he says, you're not in the treatment centre, you're in East Ham Memorial Hospital for the mentally ill. And I said, there's been a terrible mistake. <laughs> Please let me out. I signed myself in and I, I could have signed myself out any time I want, no one told me. How long did you stay there for? About seven days. And you didn't know you could get out? No, I just thought I'd done it wrong this you time. You weren't well, mate. I'm looking, I'm looking for... You weren't well. Yeah, but the doctor said at the end of it, there's nothing wrong with you. Really? He said, you're not mentally ill. He said, you... you well, I disagree with he that. He said, you, you? You, you've been... You, you're you down here. No, I ain't holding you, doctor. What? This is, this is, this is insanity. <laughs> he, said, uh, he said, you're not mad, you're sad. Okay. And my wife was sitting there and he showed us a graph. It's a max graph, it's called of alcoholism and it's up there. He said, you'll run you're away okay. from wet brain. You. Is that what he said to you? I said, so I'm an alcoholic. He said, I can't take an alcoholic. He said, you've got this like that. Can you tell, give me a letter to say that I'm not mad? And he went, yeah. So he gave me a letter. This is insanity of me. Yeah. I've turned up at East End, me, <laughs> Alcoholics Anonymous. Earliest I've ever been. Got there, sat down. <laughs> Willie was doing it, yeah. And the chair's going to, he's done his chair, this that, and the other. Pulled the letter out, I said, my name's Michael. I may, or I may not be an alcoholic. And they started snickering. I said, I've got a letter here from a prominent psychiatrist who says I'm not mad, I'm sad, and I may or may not be an alcoholic. And they went, well, if I'd had an Uzi, you know what I mean? Oh, mate. And Willie, just bless him, he went, Michael, he said, no one could diagnose you if you're an alcoholic or not. He said, you've got to make your own mind up if you are, you ain't, if you're powerless or whatever. Mm. He said, and uh, by the way, he said, that doctor got that wrong. Yeah. You're fucking bomb bombs. Bomb bombs. <laughs> and, uh, they all laughed again, didn't they? Yeah. Well, that's alcoholics and I'm saying, yeah, we laughed. But you knew there was something there because you kept going back. But then again, you had nowhere else to go. No. Did you? And when I, when I finally got in the treatment centre, I still don't know how I got in that treatment centre, but I got in the treatment centre. But uh, I thought you'd mob in here, mate. Such a lousy job of getting me sober because you you failed. I told everybody in the meeting you failed. Every one of you in here failed. No one's got me sober, and I really meant it. And they're laughing. They thought I was being funny. Well, I meant it. So I'm going to see the gardeners. So I went in to see the gardeners, and they sent me back the way home. <laughs> so I'm there in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, slagging off the treatment centre. Then I'm in the treatment centre, slagging off Alcoholics Anonymous. So. There's not a formulation there for someone who's going to get sober, is it? I, no. I wasn't well. See, it's why I wasn't well. But you know what? What's important here, the next question I've got for you, actually, is because there's not many people in long, long-term sobriety, I don't feel, in the world, right? So how many years sober, right? 22 in January. 22 in January, right? Mm. That's powerful. Is it? Yeah, fuck me, that's powerful. How's that not powerful? I think it's too, 20, I think it's too yeah, powerful because no one wants to talk to me anymore. Listen, guys, right? If people have just listened to that journey, that belligerent, that won't be told, that, that voice in your head um, telling you to fuck off, not doing what you're told to do, yeah? yeah that yeah, journey, yeah, right? right? And now you're 22 years sober. That's powerful. Yeah. That's powerful. Yeah. Fuck but do you know what? I should be dead tonight. You should be dead. You should be dead. Uh, you should be very unwell. Yeah, there's a geezer telling me I'm one away from wet brain. So I've yeah, you should be dead. There, right? And you're right, that is rare because we're very good in Alcoholics Anonymous of keeping people for a year or two years and yeah. they just get fed up. Yeah, yeah. And they get what you said, you know, I'm all right. I'm yeah, all but right. you know the biggest thing here, the biggest, biggest, biggest thing here for me, listening to you, is that journaling you did for eight years, I believe is a massive part of why you're 22 years sober. Oh, uh, really? and, and really helped a lot. Of people. Yeah. I took, I took so many. Probably didn't do me off any good, but I, I took a lot of people through the work. You and did. I don't know what they are. I don't know what they're doing. But you they, took, they pop you up. took so many people yeah. through the work. So and people. some of them relapsed. And I always told me in the bit, go and get another sponsor. Yeah, yeah. Go yeah. through this work again. Yeah. Yeah. Because you ain't God. Exactly. And yeah. it, it, you might have missed something. You might want to share something. But. Uh, so go on. In, uh, listen, we're going to wrap up in a minute, and I want you to we're tell us. We're going to talk yeah, right. we've been talking about it now. And I don't even know what we're talking about. It's just gone. No, me neither. It's fucking unbelievable. Do you know what I mean? But it's, I'm telling you now, somebody will get something from this conversation and there'll be more than one, right? I have already, anyway, because I've really enjoyed it. But I want you to give us a message to people out there 
um, newcomer, oldcomer, uh, someone who's working a program, ain't working a program, someone who's, who, who's belligerent, who don't want to work it, whatever it is, is it a message, some kind of hope. Well, in one, you can't get what I've got because I've done it differently. I mean, to, I'm going to do it differently for you because you're on a journey, but yep. I met some wonderful, wonderful people, funny enough, two Irish people, Mickey O and uh, Jean, Jean, both did. And they're still a part of my life, even though I'm dead. I've done a chair. I didn't do a chair. I shared back to this woman who was talking about it. It's only a few months ago, and I was, like, oh, God, I was crying. So I never really grieved me, you because know, we sort of fell out. And uh, and the, if we, I've got them on my photo, and we think, I'll just, do uh, make me what? What, what, you know, there's, <laughs> there's someone to emulate, like, be like Jean, and be like me, and be like Kevin, and be like loads of people in me, but, the Irish geezer, I'll talk about the Irish now, they're all kind people. Aren't they? But he said, uh, Frank, never took me through the work, never spoke about a step, don't think he would done the steps, I think he might have done, I don't know. But he, uh, he had a lovely soft, big Irishman, he had a big soft spoken voice and he said, how could I be so wrong for so long? Mm -hmm. And he died and I forgot about it and one of his, one of the persons in the room, he, he shared what he shared the other day. I've got goose pimples come on my back. Mm. So like, I went, wow. And it, I really, really, because he used to say it as a matter of fact, but then I just really thought about it and I thought, how could I be so long, so wrong rather, for so long? And if you're looking at this and you don't think you're wrong, or if you do think you're wrong and you're just getting rid of it, how long? Are you going to be so wrong for? Yeah, yeah. So if you're not getting it, maybe you're doing something wrong. Mm. Is what you're saying. Mm. Step up the ante. Yeah. And the more you put into early recovery, the longer it lasts for when you when you stop going to meetings and that. If you stop going to meetings, I'd advise you just keep make this your own and, and just keep coming back. And uh, I used to wait when people said that. Just keep coming back. But make sure you're helping someone as well. And uh, you don't have to do it in the rooms, you can do it anywhere, you help someone. Of course you can. And that's what you're doing. Carrying a message, that's what you're mate. doing. Yeah, you're helping loads of people, and you're not necessarily alcoholics, whatever, but you're doing, you're doing good. Uh, I've got a mate who's a, a Roman Catholic priest, he's a Monsignor, Father John, and we went to school together. And uh, he's the longest mate that I've had, really, and he's always stuck to all day, whatever, but he, he uh, I went and listened to one of his sermons when I was a year sober, he'd done a midnight mass. Church is packed, and he thanked everybody for coming. And he said, "And uh, what are you doing?" He said, you, you, "Whether you're a Catholic, you ain't a Catholic." He said, "You're searching for good." He said, "Whether you, you're here for a reason, and it's a good reason, uh -huh. and you're looking for good." Good. He said, "The Anglo-Saxon word for God was good." Right. So keep searching for good, good. and uh, you won't be wrong. Sun. Wicked. Put it there. Thanks, Michael. Guys, I hope you're enjoying the Sober Stew podcast and the episode today. Listen, I'm asking for a massive favour here. If you like the show, you like the podcast, and you feel like you're getting relevant content from it, please like and subscribe and share the channel, yeah? The way I see this is the more people know about this channel, the more chance we've got of spreading the message of recovery. And that might change one person's life. And if we do, that's enough. But let's look at it in a different way. If we save one person's life, that's massive. Please like, share, subscribe. God bless.